Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the uh, meeting of the Libertarian Alliance. We meet every Tuesday, every uh, every second Tuesday of the month. But it's the third Tuesday on this particular month because we've overlooked the first of April. Um, well, anyway, without any more ado, I'll hand over to our speaker tonight, who is Nico Mitten, who's going to talk on uh, immigration. So thanks. Yeah, thanks, David. Yes, I, I want to talk a little bit uh, about immigration because it is obviously um, a big uh, subject in politics, and um, a lot of people, for some reason, find it very important. I mean, if you look into the current electoral campaign for the European uh, Union election, uh, party elections, um, you would see that a lot of there are quite a number of people who will probably give their votes to to a party uh, depending on whether they're good or bad on this particular subject and uh, interestingly enough i i found increasingly that um, there are also a lot of people in the libertarian camp who call themselves libertarians who are increasingly critical of of uh, immigration uh, and willing to support state policies to uh, to restrict immigration from 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 happening um, so i find this i find this a, a bad trend and these people seem to be quite vocal because i could find much more uh, uh, online um, that is anti-immigration than pro-immigration although i still think that the that the consent uh, uh, among libertarians is more um, for open borders than than the opposite uh, so I think it's worth going through the main fallacies that are in this debate um, uh, from a libertarian perspective, but not just from a libertarian perspective, also from a general uh, political uh, um, perspective, uh, because I think it helps to understand the uh, political debate uh, on this issue. Um, there are big, uh, two big areas, obviously, that um, needs to be covered for this. There's first uh, a big economic aspect, which will... Um, which will uh, probably be the majority of my talk. And then there are, for this particular subject, there are also political uh, implications of, of immigration that are, of, of immigration that are worth uh, listening, worth uh, mentioning. So it's, it's quite a lot to cover, and uh, I hope I get everything in uh, the time we have. So um, I may, may only be able to touch on a, on a few issues and not go too, too much into detail uh, on a few arguments. Uh, so if you want to have more details on that, then please, you know, maybe we leave that for the Q&A. But I want to touch, I want to uh, at least touch the, the main issues about this debate. Uh, before I go into economics and political implications, however, I, I want to quickly make the um, principal libertarian um, view on this because you know we are libertarians so we should at least send what what see what is the principal libertarian view on this and it's interesting i just mentioned that um there are libertarians critical of of, of immigration of open borders of, of um and supportive of of government restrictions of immigration but i haven't really found any libertarians who are criticizing this on a principled ground so they seem to basically agree that, in principle, um, borders should be open. And uh, it's, it's really quite easy to see that why that is, because um, what is immigration policy, it is, uh, what is anti-immigration policy, is, is essentially putting a middleman, by, a government middleman, between, um, between to, to market agents, so between maybe an employer and an employee who are, just happen to be on different sides of the border and happen to have uh, different passports. And the government gets between us. If, if they want to make a deal, they first need to go to the government and ask the government if that is okay to do this. Uh, and only if the government approves of this, of course, then they can make the deal they want to make. And that is, of course, a, a huge infringement on on the liberty of, of both sides, on, on, on the side that is uh, in the in the area of the government, but also, of course, on, on the outside for, 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 um, for the person who is on the other side of the border. So, the principled case uh, on, on this is, is really that simple. I mean, there's there's not much more to it. I haven't really seen anyone trying to de defute it. Well. 
there is one maybe Hans Hermann Hoppe who is trying to uh, kind of make a little bit of a principled case on this. But I have to be honest, I don't understand his argument there. Um, yeah, that's, that's the problem. I, I don't think he understands it because he seems to contradict himself uh, a lot. Uh, and I found even even small articles of his where he is basically contradicting himself in the same argument, in the same article, basically making the principled case for uh, border controls and the principled case against it, and he doesn't come to any conclusion. So it's it's kind of hard to see on which grounds to attack him. Um, so I don't want to dwell on Hopper too much. Uh, I um, I, uh, I think that's that's not worth it. I think we can we can sum up from a principled point of view. It is clear that borders should be open. Where libertarians actually disagree is when should borders be open? Should they be open immediately? Should, should we demand opening the borders tomorrow? Or should we, uh, should we uh, demand other policies first before uh, we can actually open the border? Of course, that is a, that is a consequentialist argument. Obviously, obviously some, some people think there are bad consequences of opening the borders that doesn't allow us from a strategic point of view to immediately let immigrants in, but we actually need to wait until a few other policies are in place. And then when, when, when uh, these conditions A, B, C are basically met, then we can open the borders and, and not, not any time before that. So, but since the principal case is, is, is clearly for open borders, uh, I think these arguments must be really, really good. I mean, there must be very severe consequences of opening borders when uh, we, we decide to go against a principle of libertarianism uh, to, um, to and, and, and just see, you know, make a cons consequentialist uh, argument, a, a consequentialist judgment. So, therefore, of course, we have to, we have to look into the, the consequences of open borders. And, um, I think we should we should start with uh, with the economic part of it because that's the biggest area and, and I think the area where there's the most confusion about this this, this subject. Um, it is it's quite interesting. I mean, as most of you will know, there are uh, different schools of economics, uh, different uh, approaches to economics that disagree on on many many things and. Um, there are, of course, economists who also make the argument that there is too much immigration. We should we should close the borders, uh, and or close them more. I, I don't think anyone really makes the case for total closure, but at least for reducing it. And some some think it should be a little bit more. A lot of economists think there should be some um, some uh, restrictions on immigration. And uh, of course, there's the Austrian school, which basically argues in favor of of free trade, of, of open borders. But it's very interesting. Even the economists who disagree with the open border policy don't do this actually on economic grounds. Because if, even a guy like George Borjas, uh, who is, I hope I pronounced his name uh, right, he's a, he's a Harvard economist and he calls himself a, a labor economist, which is a, it's a nice title to have, I guess. That's why they're advocating modern economics and not Austrian economics, so that they can have these nice titles. Um, and he's, he's basically a, an authority on that, uh, on that uh, topic. He's basically uh, giving advice to the government when, whenever they decide on, on immigration policy. So he's, he's anti-immigration, actually. But even he, if you, if you look what he, what he does, but even he does not dispute the fact that open borders have actually a positive economic, or an overall positive effect on the economy. It's not so that... that we should expect any any negative uh, um, implications of this. He basically argues, yeah, but the effects will not be very big, and therefore we can afford to close the borders for all these other reasons, you know. Uh, but it's interesting that an economist who should actually focus on the economic part of it is advocating a policy against his own own field. So there is relatively little disagreement on this. Everyone agrees that open borders will, will be a positive, the, the overall effect of it will be positive. So why is there then so much confusion? I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of people argue the, the opposite. Um, why is there, when, when there's so much agreement among schools who, are, who usually don't seem to agree, 
why do they disagree, why do they agree on this? Well, because it is it is quite a clear cut case, and we should go into the details of it to to understand why that is. Um, I couldn't help but but watching uh, one of these debates about uh, between Nigel Farage and Neglect, um, which uh, I think it was the first debate. I think they did two, and I, I watched a bit of the of the of the first one, I believe, which were. I only watched 30 minutes, I didn't watch to the end. But they, in the first half an hour, they were, had already discussed a lot of um, uh, immigration policies, actually. And Farage played the role of you know, the anti-immigration guy, and Niklek, interestingly, was in favor of it, although I'm not sure if he, if he really knew why. Um, but anyway, he was in favor of it. And uh, Farage made, made a classical argument, basically, that sums up all the confusion in this area. He, his argumentation was, bit, was a bit like this. We have, uh, of course, this is not open borders with everyone there. We're talking about open borders with the EU. But in the EU, he was already disagreeing that we should have open borders. And his argument was this. Um, we have right now open borders with the European Union. That has caused um, a lot of economic damage in, in, in this area, in, in, in the UK, because now you see a lot of uh, young people not finding jobs anymore, and he, he blames this partly on, on immigration. And what he wants to do is to um, take the control over who is coming in back to the, uh, to the people in this country. Because right now he feels now, now the control is obviously not in, in the hands of, of, the, of the people because there are open borders. So that's basically his argument. And first of all, it's, it's, in, it's very important to, to, to see the nature of this argument. It is, I think, a, a very classic central planning argument. Because what, what does he say? First of all, he, he gets reality upside down. He's, I think right now, immigration is in the control of the British people because right now the British people decide who they want to hire, who they want to rent their property or sell their property to, which is of course exactly what, what uh, control we, we need. So he doesn't, he doesn't actually want to give it back to them, he wants to take it away from them and gives the control to the government, which he describes as the British people, which is uh, it's, it's quite amazing how someone can twist reality so and so much, but that's, that's uh, politics. Um, so the, the basic, the, uh, the, basic uh, the fun, uh, fundamental principle behind this argument is, of course, of a plant economy. Obviously, Farage thinks he knows better than the market which people are needed and which are not needed. Um, and then you have to wonder immediately, well, how does he know that? Um, well, he doesn't tell. He has, he has a kind of, I think you keep, um, basically propagates a kind of point system like the one in Australia where immigrants are supposed to um, get points and then if you get enough points, you get the right to stay. And, um, but then it's not clear how, how, how are these points going, going to be given away? You know, who decides? Who gets which points? You know, it's not the economy; it's again politics. So it just it's basically um, making it look like he knows what he's doing, but really, if you look into this point system, he has no clue what he's doing whatsoever. Because the way these points are are, are distributed is totally random. I mean, he, he just comes up with the idea: okay, we need these type of people, so these type of people get this this points, not knowing whether we really need these people. I mean, how can we know? How many people are supposed to move from Romania, from Bulgaria, or France to the UK? And if we, know, if there was a mechanism to 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 know that, then why can we use that mechanism, for example, to establish exactly how many people should move from Yorkshire to London or from Greenwich to to Mayfair? You know, um, of course, no one, no one, no one suggests that. No one suggests that government should control who's who's moving from Yorkshire to London on an economic basis. Uh, everyone, everyone seems to immediately see that that's nonsense. You know, the government cannot know that. But the government apparently knows immediately when, as soon as we uh, get on the other side of the border, how many and which people are supposed to come. So the 
So the main argument here is, is fundamentally a, a, a central planning argument. And all the nonsense that applies to all the other cases of central planning also apply here. And I think there are two big fallacies, economic fallacies, that are associated with, uh, with this type of argumentation. Um, first is, of course, the idea that if the government doesn't regulate, there are no regulations. That's, that's, a, that's the main idea. So he basically advocates the idea that um, if uh, he is in favor of, of a control versus a total chaos, which he thinks we have right now. But I would disagree. I'm, I'm actually advocating open borders, of course. But of course, by no means, I don't advocate uncontrolled immigration. You know, no one has to, the right to live in my, my house, of course, for, for example. Um, I advocate a controlled immigration. It's just the question is, who is supposed to control the immigration? The government or maybe other entities? And I, of course, very much advocate uh, the control by, by the free market and, and not by the government. Uh, now, how does, how does the, the market regulate immigration? Well, like it regulates everything through economic calculations. Uh, let's say you, you want to make a holiday. Now, how would you do that, you know? Obviously, what you wouldn't do is just drive to the airport, you know, and jump into the next plane that leaves to wherever it, it leaves to and then see what happens, you know? That's not how you do it. What you do is you pick a target, you, you, you research uh, which, uh, which transportation you have, how, how much this transportation costs, uh, what kind of accommodation you can get on the other side, how much uh, the life that costs, and then you add all this up and then you see if you can afford it or not. And very often you might find that, wait a moment, uh, this is actually too expensive. I, I would like to go there. It, it seems like a good place to go, but actually the economics of it, I can't afford to go there. And then I don't go. This is, this is a very effective mechanism with which the market regulates basically everything. Of course, it's not perfect because obviously it's depending on people calculating and you may make a mistake, you may misjudge certain things and Sure, there are mistakes in it, but it is, it is a pretty good uh, mechanism, certainly much better than some very rigid point system that the government could come up with. And really, what applies to holidays, of course, applies also to, to immigration. For example, I, uh, I know quite a few people who told me they would actually also like to live in London. It's a good place to be. I, I, I like to be here. It's, uh, it offers good entertainment, and uh, it's, it's, it really has a, has a good value of life here. Um, but the reasons, I, I, even know, I even know one guy who, who's, who taught me he had specific plans to move here and then didn't do it. And the reason why they didn't do it is not because of visa restrictions, because they were all EU citizens or in one case even a, a UK citizen. The reason why they didn't move here was because they did economic calculation and found out, yeah, it's a good place to live, but not for that price, actually. That, then it, it, it isn't worth it, or maybe not, not, it is not only not worth it, I cannot afford it at all, maybe. So we see that this is a very effective regulate, uh, uh, regulating um, mechanism, and this mechanism has, has one, one beautiful principle in it that uh, is, I think, very important to understand, and that is this. Whenever two people according to Austrian economics, whenever two people exchange a good or a service or agree on, on any contract, both sides win. That's very important to understand. Because of subjective value theory, both, both sides judge the exchange a little bit differently, and therefore both sides win. This, is, this always has to happen if you have a free contract. So with this mechanism in, in itself, it, it should be it should be clear that it's hard to argue why, when you open the borders, when you basically just get the government out of the way, why this should lead to any form of economic downturn, why anyone, why, why the economy should suffer un, under this act. Because all that happens is that more people can make contracts, contracts in which both sides are profiting. So the net effect must be positive. Where is someone losing something? That's, that's the big, that's a big problem. So with this simple mechanism, you can already clearly see that 
the, the idea of, of an overall negative effect on the economy must be, must be nonsense. At least if, if this mechanism is, is, is true, which we can assume it is because uh, Austrian economics seems to do quite good predictions with this. So that, that's the first big fallacy in, in, in this, this whole debate. You know, markets are chaos and governments are, are uh, structure and, and bring light into the, the chaos. No, it's, it's of course markets are much more regulated than governments could ever do them and much more efficient regulated than any government could, could ever do it. And it's a win-win situation. Yeah. Everyone on the market wins. And this is immediate, of course. It's not in the, in the distant future people win. As soon as they make a contract, as soon as they exchange things, they win. Um, the second uh, big fallacy in this debate is to assume there is some kind of national economy that we can look at from a, like a, an isolated point and, uh, and can just describe independent of anything else. Of course, there are national effects of economies having to do with you know, uh, local regulations of the government, but they, they are basically all bad. They, they basically prevent um, wealth creation instead of enhance them. The real wealth creation, the real, um, the real wealth that we can consume is actually whatever is produced in the world, whatever we can buy for our, for our hard-earned money. And that, of course, is a worldwide market. We have a worldwide market of goods and services. So it should very much interest us when some areas of the world are not very productive. Because when they are not productive, that means they don't produce in goods that we then cannot buy. So that, that is bad for our very own standard of living. Um, so we, we actually ha have not just a humanitarian interest in opening the borders to let in these poor, poor refugees or whatever. We actually have a very, um, very selfish interest in getting these people, because they live obviously in, in places where they cannot be productive, because you know if, if you're if you're in a, in a third world country, they very often have trouble with uh, with even stable governments. So the government might change constantly, it might have conflict. Makes it, these things make it very hard to plan any form of infrastructure uh, project that is that is a bigger scale and will take a lot of years to 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 finish. Uh, because you never know what will happen in the next few years uh, politically. And since they cannot do this, as long as these things are unstable there, uh, they have very, very little chance of becoming really productive where they are. So since we have a world economy, we actually have a big interest that these people start moving somewhere where they can be productive, so that they can produce stuff that we then can consume. So it's not only we need to understand what this argument is saying. This argument is not just saying we should open the border because it's wrong to have it, you know, for a principal reason, wrong to have it closed. This argument is actually saying not only should we, should we open the border, we should hope for these people to come here and be pro more productive. Um, so our, our whole standard of living depends on, 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 on these things. To, to, uh, for, for the world economy to become more and more productive. It's, uh, that's a pretty, pretty simple principle, I believe. And um, therefore, I not just hope that they open the border, I hope a lot of people will show up from places that cannot be productive and, and start being productive here. Um, and I think you need to look at it from, from a principle point of view, because a lot of people then start, because they look at, uh, at the economy, as a, as a national economy, they then start going into GDP per capita and these kind of things, which of course is, is nonsense because you have an isolated, artificially defined GDP that is supposed to, to happen on, on, for example, this island, and then you divide it by the, by the number of people that are there. Um, and of course, if, if you then move more people, then you have more people to divide it with, and then GDP per capita goes down, which is just a good... Uh, an argument to not do economics with statistics, but you actually need to understand what's going on on the ground, because that is, of course, not what's happening. Just because these people move here doesn't mean the locals will just give them a, sh a share of the wealth that is here, you know? They, 
they have to earn that. They have to they have to cooperate with the locals to to uh, to participate in the wealth creation. They they cannot just get it from them. So this whole argument that by by moving poor people into the area in which this statistic of GDP is calculated, uh, that that makes everyone poorer is is, is sheer nonsense. It's just confusing yourself with with statistics. But there are also two other aspects about this national economy that very often play into that. And that is, people assume there is a fixed amount of wealth in an economy and a fixed amount of jobs. And if you assume that, then it's clear when well, more people move here, then more people com competing for the same wealth and the same amount of jobs, which will lead to a harsher lives and, uh, for, for, for everyone who was previously in there and, and everyone will, will suffer. Of course, that, that is not the case at all. Wealth needs to be constantly recreated, you know, and uh, it's, it's not at all a fixed pool of wealth there that, that can be distributed among, uh, among people. And there is certainly not such a thing as a fixed amount of jobs. If you move more people, if more people move here, then these people have, of course, needs, which uh, which will also create more more, more jobs, and so the the demand for, for for this takes care of itself in in essence. Well, some people might argue, yes, okay, the overall effect must be positive, but certainly there are some people who say, you know, if you are a very low qualified person, then you suddenly get all these low qualified immigrants, which, you know, if you were to open the border, it's very likely that we get predominantly a lot of, um, well, we will get probably a few very high qualified and, and very low qualified. The middle class doesn't, doesn't tend to, to move because they, they're good where they are. On the richer end, people t tend to be more mobile for some reason because they can afford to. And on the very poor end, people also have an incentive to move. So you basically get kind of a, a, a shape where very high qualified, very rich people move, and lots of poor people will, will move. Um, so you can argue that the low qualified people in, in, the, in the economy where they move in will suffer a downward pressure on their, on their wages. And I think this, uh, this might happen. It, it depends, of course. It's, it's not quite clear if it's happened, of course, no one can predict markets, but it might happen. And I think it will more, more likely happen depending on how regulated the economy is they're moving into. Obviously, if the economy has a lot of regulations, uh, then creating wealth is, is, is much more difficult. And therefore, um, the downward pressure will be bigger for, for the uh, lower paid, uh, lower qualified people than if you have a very deregulated economy. And uh, I think in a, in a, in a Basically, in a free market, if you had uh, immigration, I, I don't expect this to be uh, much of an effect at all. I think the overall benefit of wealth creation would be so big that that um, probably uh, low qualified people wouldn't wouldn't see any suffering at all. But of course, we don't live in a free market. We live in a high, highly uh, regulated economy, unfortunately. So it's likely that these people will will see some negative short-term consequences. Should that be an argument against immigration is the question. Um, and I think it should not, because it's, it's, it's essentially a rent-seeking argument. Whenever, whenever the, the government puts a regulation in place, then it's doing that to protect a certain group of people from competition. That's basically behind, behind uh, regulation. Well, maybe there are a few regulations who are absolutely stupid and don't do anything good. but. Um, Usually, when, when governments propose uh, some kind of regulation, it's because some group of people has said, look, we would really like... So it's a candle maker argument from, from Frederick Gersert. We, we would really like, for the greater good, have these regulations because then everyone will be better off. But in, of, of course, they will be better off. So if you, if you allow this argument to be valid, then you essentially cannot do any de deregulation whatsoever because whenever you deregulate, you have a group of people that was protected by these, by these regulations having some short-term negative consequence. They have to reorientate themselves uh, to find new jobs and, and to maybe you know, grow their business in some other form. So if that is a valid argument, we, we're screwed. We cannot, we cannot basically deregulate at all. Um, 
And of course, it is, it's a fallacy to, to assume that this effect, this negative effect, will last very long, because it might be a, a short-term negative effect, but the long-term effect of deregulation is, of course, that the, that the economy works much better, which creates a lot more jobs, and then these people, even these people who have suffered in the short run, will be better off in the long run. So I think this is, this is a fundamentally false argument to, to make that because of some poor people, some low qualified people, we should not um, argue in favor of, of free borders because then we can basically forget about any form of deregulation. But what a lot of people, let me just not mention this for this point, um, what a lot of people doesn't, don't seem to realize is that even low qualified people uh, have usually a few qualifications um, that immigrants don't have by simply having been, uh, uh, having been raised in, in the local society. They speak the language um, and they know the, no, they know the local customs, which to locals doesn't seem to be much of a qualification because everyone seems to have it. But compared to immigrants, that is actually quite a, quite a, a severe advantage in a couple of jobs. We've seen this in, in, a, a, in the support industry. I mean, uh, I, I've seen a, a lot of companies advertising with Local support, you know, and what the, what they mean is basically everyone everyone knew these companies where you call a support and, and you talk to someone in India, which with, 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 uh, who has a had a very strange accent that, that a lot of people have, have had trouble with, and then they, they got very upset about this. And why they do this? Of course, the reason why these companies were doing this because it was much cheaper to employ these support people in India than to support than to uh, hire local people. But they've realized that a lot of these companies have basically um, made their customers uh, angry with this. And so have basically damaged their image with it. And now they have started, although it's more expensive, they have started to hire more local people uh, because they have these, these qualifications, which is speaking the language and knowing the local customs, which is, uh, which is quite an important uh, skill to have for a lot of services. So I think they, locals always have a natural advantage over, over immigrants, even if technically they're all very low qualified. So that's, that's basically the, the, the economic uh, fallacies, the biggest economic fallacies that I see in, in, the, in the whole de immigration debate. Um, and I think if, if we sum that up, it, it, it's quite clear that it's, it's, it's just a classical deregulation that's, that's taking place. And like all deregulation, it needs to, to, uh, to uh, lead to more wealth creation and everyone is being better, better off, even though some people might be uh, worse off in, in a very short run. But immigra immigration is also um, interesting for, for pure political reasons, not just for economic reasons. One aspect that actually falls into both categories, economics and political, is the welfare state, which a lot of people are concerned about. I think it was uh, I think it was uh, Milton Friedman who said that you can't have both. You can't have a welfare state and open borders, because obviously, if you have that, then a lot of poor people will just come for the benefits and will bankrupt the system. Well, I think from a libertarian point of view, the answer to that is clear. Let's get rid of the welfare state. We want to do that anyway. So why should we, why should we uh, suddenly become advocates of the welfare state just because um, uh, it, uh, it uh, would cause a problem when we open the borders? You know? I don't think it will cause that much of a problem, actually, because it's actually quite beneficiary from a libertarian point of view. When it bankrupts the system, then we might get rid, rid of it uh, of the welfare state much much quicker. But this is a simple policy we can actually do if, if the welfare state really concerns us. That can be done overnight. Uh, that that will uh, exclude um, all all possible negative implications for the welfare state. And that is just exclude immigrants from the welfare state, but, which is something you know they haven't paid in. They're not dependent on it it yet. So you could just overnight make a law. Everyone who comes in here from, from outside uh, doesn't get a penny. You know? 
not not a big problem at all. Not not something that, that will take a long time. We, we first need to dismantle dismantle the um, the welfare state. No, we can just make a law. Okay, everyone comes in, doesn't get a penny, and and that problem would be solved if, if it was. But I'm increasingly thinking actually that. Milton Friedman was actually not quite right because our experience with immigrants shows from the European Union, for example, yes, there are some people who come for the benefits, but the vast majority actually doesn't come for the benefits. Even when they come from poor countries, even when they are low qualified, even if they could technically apply for benefits, they don't come for benefits. The vast majority of people comes here to work. So they actually, by working here, become net payers into the system. Now, our welfare state is obviously a big Ponzi scheme, and uh, we, are, we are nearing a payday, I, I, would, I would say. I, I think this, this Ponzi scheme cannot go on for, for much longer. And given, given the age group of immigrants there are, it, uh, it, um, basically immigrants tend to be very young, because if you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, you don't tend to go to other countries anymore. Unless you have to, unless maybe there's a war or whatever and you have to flee or whatever. But basically, pe people who are at that age tend to not move. It's usually young people who come. And of course, in, in the, in the so-called third world, in these poor countries, you have, a, you have usually a very young population. You have people who are uh, under 30, I think. The majority of people in Africa are below 30. And uh, so what would happen is, if we open the borders, a lot of young people would come, and most of them would work, and become uh, people who pay into the system. So I, I think there is a, of course I don't know, I don't know what exactly will happen, but I think there is a, as an argument to make that this might actually rescue this Ponzi scheme for a little bit longer and, and, and keep it keep it going, which of course from a libertarian point would be actually a bad thing. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if, if Milton Friedman is, is right on, on, the, on the welfare state. He just assumes that if you give people benefits, then they will come for the benefits and nothing else, which doesn't seem to be confirmed by reality so far. Um, but there are other implications of, of opening the borders. And I think a very interesting aspect of opening the borders is if you want a freer world, if you want to... Obviously, there are lots of governments in the world uh, who, um, who are awful. And if you want to make the world a better place, a, a freer place, I think there's nothing better you can do than opening borders, because that allows people to vote with, with their feet, which I think is the absolute best vote you can have. I think I'm not a big believer in elections. Uh, I don't think we will ever change anything through elections. Uh, I believe, but I do believe that competition works. I, I do believe that politicians react to certain uh, external pressures that you put on them. So if you leave a bad run area and go to a better run area, that creates a lot of competition within the system. How much this, this matters, we can see in, in the old Soviet Union, who literally had to, had to build walls with uh, people shooting people who were trying to get out to keep the system going. If they hadn't done this, the system would have collapsed right there. So in order to, to keep the system from not collapsing, they had to do something about people leaving uh, this, this, this system and basically voting with their feet. And uh, this was already, we're not talking about like half of the population fleeing, we're talking still a relatively small amount of people actually getting out. And that already caused so much panic in, in the rulers in this regions that they had to go to these extreme measures in order to do something against it. And I think from a political point of view, we will see a lot of uh, positive political implications from, from immigration because a lot of people will obviously vote with their feet. They will go to places that are better run. That will cause uh, a, a huge pressure on, on governments to do something. And some will probably go down the route of the Soviet Union and build some walls and try to keep people from leaving, um, but some will, will probably also try to reform the system and make their own political uh, area more, uh, more attractive to, to, to the people so that they don't have to leave. So I think this is the best foreign aid you can get, and it's, it's, it comes free, it benefits us. We don't, we don't need a government to do this, we just need the government to get out of the way. And 
this um, this policy will, will, will happen autom automatically, basically, um, which is uh, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, there are these neocons who think we should go around the world bombing people to to do regime changes everywhere, and uh, and usually that ends up with a huge bill for the taxpayer, with a huge uh, loss of lives and total chaos where they where they um, where they basically uh, send their military. Uh, and it's, it's, it's the exact same people who think we have a duty to free other people who then argue against immigration, which is really quite bizarre, I must say. Um, but of course, immigration policy is not something that comes totally free. It's not something that can just be enforced by the, by the local police and, and court system that we have anyway. I mean, if you're minimal status from a libertarian view, you might support court systems and police. So if we have that, we can just make a law that makes it illegal for certain people to come here and, and they will enforce it. No, that's not quite how it works. Uh, in order to enforce this particular policy, you need to have uh, an army of people employed by the state uh, being at the border and checking whoever comes in. And so this, this is a, a, a quite an expensive uh, thing to do. I think the UK currently pays over two billion uh, in taxpayer money every year uh, for this policy and has employed over 20,000 people to do it. Not the most expensive policy they, they're doing, obviously, but still over two billion, that's, that's, that's money. That's something, uh, if we can save that, that would be good. Particularly given the fact that, as we just have seen, all they're doing is preventing people from creating more wealth, which is a, a stupid policy. But it's also dangerous from a libertarian point of view to have to give the state the authority to be able to control who is on the territory and uh, who comes in. Because increasingly, they will not just check who comes in, but they will actually start starting checking who goes out. We already see this in the, in the, in the US, where uh, it becomes, the US is unique in, in that sense that a US citizen has to pay taxes uh, on, and no matter where he earns it. You know, they, they tax their citizens everywhere in the world. And the US government makes it increasingly difficult for, tech, uh, for, for citizens to renounce the citizenship. You know, you need a, a formula to do this, to fill out, to, to apply for that. It used to be that formula is free. Now it costs, I think, $500 to get just that piece of paper to apply to get rid of your citizenship. But we also see other measures by, by, the, uh, by the US government. I mean, if the IRS, which is the tax office in, in, the, in the US, if they suspect you of owing them some money, they don't need a court decision, they, nothing. They just need to, someone in the IRS needs to suspect you to owe, owe them money. They can suspend your passport at the, uh, at the border and, uh, and you don't get out. That's as, uh, that's as simple as it is. So I, I would be very careful to, to employ an army at the borders no, uh, thinking that you can control this um, because, you know, we are the government and everything. Uh, but I think this is a, is, a, is a very dangerous illusion. I think we, we will not be able to control this. And when things go bad, this same army might turn against you and, and keep you actually from, from going out of, of the country. So it's simply that if, if to, to have this policy in, in, in place and not, not expect any negative side effects of it. Which brings me to the last point I would like to make, and that is uh, culture. A lot of people fear that if, if immigrants come in, they will change the local culture. And as far, I think pretty much all immigration arguments, as I just uh, mentioned, are, are, are bogus. They are based on, on uh, false understanding of economics or a, a naive view of the state. The only argument that at least makes some sense is this cultural argument because not I, I don't think it's a good argument but at least it makes sense in the in a in the way that the basic premise seems to be right if you get a lot of people coming from a different culture into into local culture that will likely have an effect on the culture uh, i think this is fair to assume of course as i said we don't know what will happen but i think this is very likely and so it's a very reasonable assumption to make so is this, uh, which is essentially a xenophobic argument, let's face it, um, is, this, is this a good argument for libertarians to make? 
Well, if it is, then obviously this cultural change must uh, must have some implications on uh, on our strategy, on our attempts to win win the political uh, game. And I think I think David Barker, who uh, who talked last year here. He made basically that argument. Uh, that, that was his main argument against uh, immigration: that we can't allow immigration for cultural reasons. They will basically screw up the, the local libertarian culture, and, and then it becomes impossible for us to, to to win that fight. I find this hard to believe because I don't see this great libertarian local culture. To be honest, I mean, I, that's not to say that that I don't. Uh, can, that I can't see a good aspects about Western culture. I can I can see very good aspects about it. Western culture, particularly the Enlightenment, certainly was a good thing in my view. And um, there, are, there are basically two things that, that still keep me living in the in the Western world rather than move somewhere else. And that is first the, the debating culture. I think there is still. I mean, we can we can meet here, conspire against the government, and don't have to fear. To be ending up uh, in, in some torture chamber tonight, I think that's worth something, and this is not something you, you will see everywhere. And that has to do with the idea that a lot of people here believe that uh, debate is, is is a good thing. You know, you have the right to say what you want to say, and uh, this is not an act of violence to, to say to oppose the, uh, the the mainstream views, which it is actually in a lot of, of countries that have not been affected by enlightenment where uh, opposing opinions are seen as a kind of violent act and that needs to be censorship and uh, needs, need to be deal, dealt with. Uh, so I think that that is very much uh, worth preserving. But I don't really see this uh, to be very negatively affected by, by immigrants because let's say a lot of immigrants come in. And let's, let's say the population doubles. Yeah? So we have, what, 50, 60 million people coming in. Um, and they all come from non-enlightened countries. Uh, we would still see the, the, the English to be the biggest block of, of people in this country and still be the, the people who basically have most of the infrastructure, most of, of, the, of the wealth that is currently owned here under their control. So they would still very much shape the local culture, although it might change a bit, but they would very much still argue with each other the way they're used to and would not let other other people tell them um, uh, that they cannot do this. I think the biggest threat to, to, um, to political correctness uh, and to, to, um, to freedom of speech in this country is actually political correctness, which is not something that was imported by immigrants, but it's very much something that was um, invented here. I would say. Uh, I have some sympathy for political correctness, but it certainly has gone way too far and it's now um, really leading to, to real censorship and gets some people into, into legal trouble who don't go along with it. Which, uh, But this is all wanted by the locals. This is not something immigrants have, have caused. It. The locals think they, they are. And I think one, one, of, the, one of the reasons um, they... Uh, they think this is necessary is because immigrants are very much in the minority. And they think it is, it is worth protecting a minority. But as soon as you get masses of mountains of people, I think this will stop. I think people will, will stop seeing them as a kind of uh, worth protecting, protecting minority and will, will, will start really arguing with them. And then this political correctness probably will go out of the window. So I don't, um, I don't see a, a negative impact of immigrants on, on, on this type of culture. The other aspect that I like that has to do with it is I, th I still think people are, le um, are very much against um, torture and, and these type of, of treatments of people in, in, in detention, which you can't necessarily say of most regions. I think in a lot of regions of the world, at least if you're dealing with real criminals and not with political opposition, people are kind of okay with, with a bit of a, of a rougher treatment with, uh, with uh, detainees. And I think in this country, there is still, uh, although we have seen very negative uh, developments in this, uh, you still have kind of a consensus that that is not an okay thing to do, which I which I like very much. And 
But again, I don't see this really being threatened by immigra immigrants because I don't think they come here to, to teach us torture. I just think this is a, it's a bit um, far-fetched in my view. Yeah, and uh, that's, that's basically all the points I wanted to make. I think in conclusion, uh, Im the immigration uh, debate is obviously very emotional. It, it, and that tells me that it's, it's, it's not really driven by, by rational arguments, it's, it's mostly driven by fear, which um, I think is, is a dangerous thing because fear is, uh, is, is, uh, is it, it's hard to argue with fear. If someone is in fear, then um, they will unlikely reply to a lot of uh, Russian, rational argu arguments, which makes it harder to, to do this. Uh, and what and this fear is basically nothing else but the good old fear of, of freedom, because one one aspect of freedom that is hard uh, for us as, uh, that that want to adva advance freedom is that um, freedom doesn't have certain outcomes; it has likely outcomes, but you never can say this will going to happen in, 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 a, in a free society because it's, you know it's, it's flexible it's, it's quite free and and people don't like this people people usually like the the strong guy that, that gives them some guarantee that something is going to happen even though that that person cannot deliver on, on the on, on the promise but never mind he at least gave, gave that promise and uh, I think there's a lot of this in the in the in the uh, immigration debate and people are just fearful of what's going to happen that things might change too quickly and they might might be overrun by, by, by immigrants, which, uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's a problem, but I, I at least hope that, that libertarians are not fearful of uh, freedom, because, I mean, if, if libertarians are fearful of it, then there's not much hope left, I think, so. Oh. And with that, uh, yeah. Cheering okay. out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lucy, indeed. Thank you, indeed. Is there any questions? Huh? I was somewhat alarmed to hear that you think that no one has the right to live in your house. Okay. Uh, I hope you have the right to live in your yeah. house. <laughs> Very good. Um, uh, you spoke of um, believing in open borders. Mm -hmm. I think a libertarian should believe in no borders, whatever. Yes. Apart that's... from private ones, yeah. but not national. Is it? <laughs> All right. No, that's, I agree. I, I use open borders as basically I know. getting rid of. Those are the terms that he used. Yes. Any other questions? <laughs> Bob? It should, oh, be, it should be remembered that in the 18th century, what maybe before, the idea of moving from one parish to another, especially if you had no work. Now, of course, what, that's why you're moving, mm. to try and find work or better work. Mm. But the idea, they were very terribly frightened that you'd be a burden on the next parish. <laughs> you were truly permitted in. Luckily, there were cities that weren't that were off, off, off limits, as it were. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was fortunate. It wasn't intended that um, the Industrial Revolution would happen, happen over there and over there. Um, not in established cities, it shouldn't prevent that kind of nonsense. But of course, it, it, it sprang up partly because that's where, the, that's where the water was, or that's where yeah. the coal was. But um, that's to the advantage. But certainly at that, at that time, people were very worried about, about vagrants and uh, travellers and all sorts. So it's not simply, it's not simply foreign, true foreigners, that means. It's simply the idea that, as you said, there are only so many jobs, mm. and if you know, if he comes along, he'll take my job. Yeah. And this also ties up, which you didn't touch on, with this sort of um, uh, Malthusian and um, uh, England's green and pleasant land idea that there are just too many people anyway, let alone having more here. Mm -hmm. So you ha haven't touched on that aspect of No, uh, as I said, I couldn't touch on anything. Of course, you're absolutely right. I think more people is better than less people. I, I, I found, when, when I came, to London, I realized that there are lots of Australians in London, which kind of surprised me, <laughs> because I've been to Australia, and I thought, it's a beautiful country. I mean, they have a Mediterranean climate, it's a modern civilization. What the hell are they doing? It? It's, it's, from, from their point of view, it's pretty much on the other side of the planet. You know? Pretty exactly, actually, on the other side of the planet. Um, so why are they coming here? And I asked a couple of them. I think there are actually more Australians here than Germans, although Germans have four times the population of Australians. Australia, and that's exactly the reason why they why they're coming here, because there are hardly any people in in Australia. It's 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 a pretty uh, 
empty place. I mean, you have Sydney, basically, which is a wonderful city, but then around Sydney, there's not much else. There's maybe Melbourne, and then Perth is already thousands of, of miles away, and, and, and that's it. There, there are not many people, and more people is, of course, much better. That's why so many people want to live in London. It's not because the air is so good, or the, the place is so, uh, so, so plentiful here. No, it's just because there are so many people here, and that makes a lot of, of uh, things, uh, a lot of services, and businesses more productive that would never be productive in a remote area. So yeah, I, I agree. More people is better than less people. So hopefully more come. Any more questions? I think old Malthus has got to be all tweeted again here. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. M Malthus is not a mouth. Not a Malthusian. I was like an article saying Malthus is not a Malthusian. Is there any more questions? Um, I'll just give a little few. I come a little late. I picked up a few things which I thought were pretty naive. Oh, say the least. You say that more people is better than less people. We need more people here. Yes. But, I mean, if you actually look well, we don't need them, but it would be it would be better. If you actually look at the stats, I mean, we can't feed our population. <laughs> I have great trouble myself, man. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have to move forward. I think it's at least a third, something like that. From, from the countryside? It's a third and a, quarter, a, a, and a half of the food we eat. Yeah. I mean, a good example of it, I mean, we've got 60, what, 62 and a half million now. Yeah. During the war, we had 40, less than 40 million. And then <laughs> they were in trouble because the, 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 the convoys bring the food in. You know, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> because that's because Germans were coming in. The fact is that we can't feed the population. That's why we have to export. That's a simple reason why we have yeah. to export. Well, that's free trade. There's so many people that we can't feed them. Let alone house them. We can't house them either. Well, we can build so, more houses. Well, you need money. Well, <laughs> yeah, but look, if, if they don't ca can pay for an accommodation, they will probably not say. But I don't remember, uh, when, when Margaret Thatcher was on the floor, she said, uh, she quoted the Green Party, saying, look, we're going to only sustain 25 million in a, in a green civil society. I mean, 60 odd million is ridiculous. It's, it's going to be 70 million soon, 100 million by 2050. She said, don't vote for the Green Party because they want to bring the population down to 25 million. And they haven't said how they're going to get rid of the extra what, 30 million. <laughs> <laughs> and that should worry everyone. That was a quote, quote from Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a um, Thatcher uh, fan. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I'm not here to defend Thatcher, certainly. But uh, I think, you know, I, I'm not worried about this island. As I said, there is. There's no such thing as a national economy. We, we, we trade with the whole world. And if food production here is not the best way to do this, then let someone else do it, and then we, we exchange it for some goods here. It's, it's perfectly fine. I think self-sufficiency is, 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 is nonsense. Uh, and uh, we, we, we got rid of it for, for a reason. So the only worry about this <coughs> that we have to import food is that the currency we're paying with it is, is currently uh, inflated a lot, and that might lead to some problems. Uh, but that's a different topic. Just, just to point out how, how finely balanced this is. If you go back a few years, do you remember the tanker driver strike? Do you yeah. remember that, the fuel strike, a few years ago, when the tanker drivers were on strike? They were on strike for about three or four days. Anyway, that long story short, that as the, in, on the island of big item market there, there was fighting in the islands there with the grid, uh, because there wasn't and actually, I've got people fighting in the grid that was doing the tank drive strike. And I think in that area, they were, they were on strike for about two days in that area. But that's, that's just give you, should give you a cause for thought. For two uh -huh. days, two days, and you have, you have people fighting over food. You know, so it is something which is of vital importance. Yes, I agree. We need free trade. And it's taken care of. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I was thinking along to go to touch on the cultural question. Um, I, I, I somehow think that, that it's a, this is a very small island like Japan, and I think the reason why this, this island has always had a relatively 
prosperous populations, it has to be something to do with culture, because like probably don't have things like oil, or gold, or diamonds, and that sort of thing. So you, you could say that in this region, people are fairly affluent because there's something about their culture that's giving them the tools to be able to do this kind of thing. And then if you allow uncontrolled immigration, and you have people coming from regions where they're completely unsuccessful, uh, and their ability to kind of take care of their own population. Not only that, but you're going to get the people who can't survive in those societies at the very bottom of those societies coming in. And I would, I would, I would tend to think that there's, there's a strong chance of it to put balance and actually change it so that this region becomes really difficult for people to sustain the standard of living as it is now. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that this country is certainly. Um has developed a good culture of, of, of freedom, in the, particularly in the 19th century. Uh, but I think that one of the main reasons is that this is an, a, quite a naturally protected uh, a place where it's not as threatened by war as, as a lot of other countries. I think the main driver behind not having a civil society is, is, is war. And, and if you're constantly attacked from the outside, you have to defend yourself. That builds up not very civil societies and not very free societies. So I think the reason why this was built here, this could emerge here, has a lot to do with uh, this island being relatively um, protected from war. Of course, not, not totally, there, there have been invasions of this, uh, this island, but I think it has a lot to do with that. I don't see these immigrants playing a, an important, uh, a bad part in, in culture, because I think we, we now have capitalist societies and, and these capitalist uh, work sharing uh, div um, division of labor uh, establishing uh, societies have a, have a huge dynamic of of um, of keep keeping people integrated into the system because as soon as people have something to lose they tend not to fight and as soon as you give them a chance to to take part in in, in capitalism in in, in, in uh, building up their own capital they will be interested that uh, this this system that, that provides them with um, with this wealth is not um, is not destroyed. And, and I think this is no matter where they come from, they will very quickly integrate into that part of culture. They might still have their own religion or whatever that is independent of that, but I think they will very much be part of a civil society if they if they come here uh, within a, a capitalist system. Because if this was a totally centrally planned economy, then they wouldn't uh, come here. Then, then that might cause some problems, but then they wouldn't come here in the first place. We, we, we saw this, uh, you know, with the uh, Soviet Union. It wasn't, they didn't have an immigrant problem, but, uh, problem with people trying to get out. So as long as, as, as we have freedom, free, enough freedom to produce wealth, people will come here because they try to take part in that. And when they try to take part in that, they are very quickly integrated because Trade is, is the best uh, recipe against violence, I think. Either, either you trade with, with people or you will have violence. But isn't there a lot of evidence that that's exactly not happening? Like if you take, like the French seem to feel, they don't agree with what they, they immigrants there, they feel they're not adapted and they, they're hostile to, to the French way of life. And in England as well, the people would say they can't stand the thing of female gentle mutilation. These communities are insisting they're going to keep doing that no matter what. Yeah, I think immigrants are, are, are a scapegoat for politicians. They like to blame their problems on, on some, some strangers. So what I'm getting at is that I don't see any evidence of they change their culture to adapt to the local culture. Well, they, I think most, most immigrants are very peaceful. They, they behave, they, they take part in, in, uh, in, in trade and uh, build up companies. So I, I don't have, I, I live in a very, I mean, I'm an immigrant myself, of course, from Germany, which is culturally not too exotic. Probably. But um, I live in I live in uh, Streatham and work in Brixton, which is actually the majority of people that come from outside the, the uh, uh, from outside Europe, and I don't have any problem with them. They're, they're very friendly. Of course, I can see they have different you know religions and that kind of thing, but they're all trading with each other, and they're very much friendly people. I I, I don't see any problem unless. You start pointing fingers at them, and then they have, they have an in instinct, of course, to defend themselves against a system that that isn't very friendly towards them. That's <laughs> well, I have to say that I agree with Brit. Um, and I think that the problem is that immigrants are not really part of the culture. They're not 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 part of
as possible without some kind of ethical framework. If you don't have a, um, an understanding of, of why um, personal freedom is necessary, you won't have a form of freedom. And that's why I have to take issue with your comments about economic freedom being the gateway to enabling these immigrant communities to thrive. Because short term, yes, they will well start businesses, etc. etc. But over generations you probably see that um, that benefit will be. No, I disagree. I think the uh Particularly, the, the second generations tend to be already quite integrated. Usually, they they, they have their. Well, I, I, from my experience, definitely, I work as I said in Brixton. I have a lot to do with second generation uh, uh, immigrants from the Caribbean and and from from Nigeria. A lot of them are from Nigeria. I'm always amazed how British they are. They they tend to have a lot of habits that I only know from British people. Also showing them. Uh, already in the second generation, that growing up in Brixton, which is really, they are pretty much among them, them, themselves. So I, I disagree. I mean, this is an, is an argument that has always been made. For example, in the US, they were very, very worried about all these Germans coming in. And in, in Pennsylvania, for example, there was a huge debate about, oh, these Germans, they build their own communities, and they only speak German, and um, they will never integrate. There's a huge problem there. and. Uh, Reality shows that there's already the second generation. They still spoke German, but they already spoke English as well. And they're perfectly English. No one is talking about the Germans anymore in, in the US being being a big problem. But, but you make the mistake because they came from a Judeo-Christian background in the first place. I think maybe what we're talking about is is not people who are resistant to that to that culture, but dare I say it, is a bit fundamentalism. I think that will be a great threat to. Um, a bit more well, we don't see a lot of uh, Islamic fundamentalists coming in. Uh, the, the biggest, the biggest Islamic fundamentalist who did, uh, uh, for example, the, the guys who just butchered this this poor chap here in, in South London. Well, they were grown up here as, as Christians, as, as Catholics. They just converted to Islam to become terrorists. We have a similar group in, in Germany that, that you know grew up in Germany, perfectly <coughs> fine. They converted to Islam to become terrorists. These people, terrorists are not motivated by, by Islam. This is, this is nonsense. The majority of Islamic people are quite peaceful people. Uh, they are motivated by, by quite different, uh, diff different, different things. And a lot of people actually join, this, uh, join Islam to become terrorists. Their main goal is to become terrorists. And you know, that's just the ideology to do it under right now. In, uh, I don't know, in, in the 70s in Germany, they would have become communists because you know, that was the 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 uh, popular uh, terrorist culture back then. So. John, um, I think it's a rather conservative idea, a nationalistic idea anyway, that people ought to uh, adopt the culture and integrate. Uh, can't see any problem at all with people forming enclaves, whatever culture ethnic type, religious, whatever it is they want to have, as long as they buy the land and then live that way and don't bother other people. There are parts of uh, London, for instance, which are known to be predominantly of certain cultures make a beeline for that because that's what they want. They want people to speak their language and understand their customs. Uh, it's just slightly messed up by the fact that the state won't allow people to buy up land and make those areas even more culturally uh, homogeneous. Cultural homogeneity is uh, something that some people value. If you're constantly trying to undermine this, uh, you will turn the world into something ultimately uh, entirely uh, homogeneous. Can you speak up, Jan? Sorry. So it turns out that it's something entirely culturally no. homogeneous. No. What we, what we, you know, people should be allowed to integrate as much of it as they like. Now, some of the things they might choose to do within their enclaves might seem to be illiberal from the outside, given a uh, guardian reader's perspective. But from a libertarian point of view, if you go there, those are the rules. If you sign up to them, you're bound by them. But of course, if they then try to impose those on anybody outside, they should be crushed, crushed mercilessly. 
And the fact that they know that they will be, and that they see that they will be, means that they will contain themselves, and there's simply not be a problem. We can live in complete harmony with private property solves, solves, solves the problem. But what doesn't solve the problem is this nationalistic tub funding. We must all adopt the same culture and all speak the same language. This is just a uh, one. The only reason people know about nationalism, politicians in particular, is because uh, politicians, uh, politics has a legitimacy problem in the sense of moral legitimacy. Somehow <coughs> it has to demonstrate that it needs to be in charge. Uh, you no longer have the divine right of kings and uh, various other attempts. But what we have left are uh, welfare, uh, national defence, um, national culture, uh, education, and various things that, that nationalism is a, is a big thing. But nationalism is the enemy of liberty, not the friend of liberty. And uh, the sooner nationalism is rejected in favour of uh, voluntary, uh, heterogeneous areas, the better. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, of course. Uh, I, I think culture is, is, is private is a private matter and it's, it's not of anyone's business um, I just um, think the, the aspect that you mentioned is, is important that they do this peacefully and not which of course when you when you talk about Islamic fundamentalists who are trying to impose Sharia which is the idea uh, that would not be peaceful obviously but I don't see this happening I don't see violent groups of, of immigrants coming in to, to destroy us, you know, this is just a bit paranoid in my view. I, I don't I don't see much example for that. And if they do, well, then we fight them. That's uh, we, we can fight that group. I, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but so far, the immigrants tend to be quite peaceful because because they take part in, in in capitalism. I think the vast majority of people is actually not very political. They want to live their lives and they want to be left alone. And as long as you do that. That there's so that's not much problem in in, in my view. Well, uh, the most important culture is a kind of a bourgeois world culture that you learn at your mother's knee and other joints, to some extent. Um, don't touch it; it's not yours. Mind that man. So we learn the idea that it's not yours. Leave it alone. Don't steal. The rest of it. The, the added local things might be religion or culture or cuisine or whatever it might be. Okay, we can we can live with um little little. It's a bit like um what's a fractal world. So you have little bits of the world because that you like other parts, and they're all around the world. And I I, I can happily live with that. In fact, you might like to go there for a holiday or a night out. You might want to live there. But you might go to little Italy or a little whatever or a little whatever because they they have their own culture. But there is a no a more abstract overarching culture is which is private property. Volunteerism, yeah. and that seems to be that the world is it. Well, the world always did accept it yes. to a great extent. That's it. It's a very minimalistic approach that is so self-explaining that I think everyone instinctively agrees to it, unless you force them not to. Which usually is, it needs politics to do that. I think most most people that I meet, no matter where, and I've been to a couple of countries, most people seem fine. They're, they're nice people. They, they just you know they're friendly. They I I, I, don't, I don't see. That. I have a problem with xenophobia because can I, can I uh, it's, it's against because my. If you keep going on about these people are perfectly nice, they, I don't. From my point of view, it's not about. I mean, it's, it doesn't matter how nice they might be, which which I agree, it's great. And I like the idea of diversity, you know, I mean, allowing people to establish communities. And it really does. It's great. It's lovely. Um, my concern is just that if, you, that, uh, if I can mention Max Weber's Protestant ethic thesis. Where there's, he argues there's, a, there's an elective affinity between certain their cultural features, their religious beliefs and practices and culture, that give them that advantage so that they, they become a driving engine of early capitalism. And what I was saying earlier about something about a place like England and Japan, it's tiny islands and they don't have natural resources that should make us wealthy. But somehow they have a leg up and they have an advantage. And all I'm saying is that as nice as people might be, they could just be, it could just be a recipe for disaster. They, they, they're just going to change fundamentally the way of life happened. And then those little cultural features that, as you say, are very difficult to define. 
And I definitely also wouldn't be in favor of people coming out and being forced to that forced to learn. Even they want to speak their own languages, that's fine. It's, it's none of your you know, it's none of your business basically what they're speaking next door, what they do. But there is I think there's a danger that you could radically change the, the whole thing here. And then you've got a small island without that cultural capital. And how do you feed all those people if you don't have that cultural capital? I think uh, free trade is uh, is something that is not just uh, known to Western culture. I think the Arabs, for example, trade for, forever. The, uh, the the Chinese have traded forever. There might be some some tribes in Africa who haven't figured that out yet, but um, I think the majority of people who will come here will understand free trade. We're already trading with all these these these, these countries uh, quite quite uh, easily and uh, w without any problem. And I think that's that's the main thing. We need to be able to trade with them and, and be peaceful around them. And all the rest, I think, is, is none of our business. That's, uh, that's, that's how I see it. John? Then uh, Pat, and then David, and then... I just wanted to emphasize the sense in which nationalism is a problem, because while you have politics, either somebody is, to some extent, uh, aggressively imposing his, his culture upon you, or you are aggressively imposing your culture upon him. It creates a war against the war against the war, as precisely as Hobbes did understand about politics. Politics is the cause of the problem, not, you know, not the absence of politics. And uh, as soon as you remove that and you say, look, you go over there, we leave you alone, awful lot of the the, uh, the, uh, the feeling of being oppressed simply goes away. Uh, and even the people who are indigenous, um, homegrown uh, Islamic terrorists, whatever, as soon as they see nobody is trying to impose in any non Islamic way of life on you. But that's what they, they, they walk around the street, they say, I don't like these people drinking alcohol. I don't like women dressed like this. Yet everywhere I go, I can't get away from it. Okay, suddenly they're going to be able to get away from it. Then, then that just gives them an unsafe face. It's not, it's, it's not being imposed on you. You have it over there. We have it over here. Uh, I was in this uh, Iowa a few years ago uh, on the grounds of the Amish communities. And, um, uh, you know, these things carry on. And on and on. There's, there's no reason why some culture should disappear it's because they're, you value it. Mm. Uh, and so I think that something like these man or two days and whatever can in some form just continue indefinitely. It's not it's not a problem, it's actually a solution. The diversity of cultures is actually something desirable because uh, we ourselves might find uh, try uh, Tried this, it, you know, I might want to try that in the same way that we might want to try a different cuisine. I think. So, politics is the absolute opposite of any possible solution. It is almost entirely the sole cause of the conflict. It is a form of, of uh, triumphalism. We're dominant, you're all going to do it the way we say. Well, yeah. I, I think there might not be any dominance. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. Uh, it's just um, I can see the concern that uh, you know not everyone is is a libertarian right now, and a lot of people think in these po political solutions. And as long as a lot of people think in these political solutions, uh, they they I can at least see the concern that uh, that is uh, that might be a problem if other people from other cultures come in. I disagree with them, however, that this is practically I think it it is a mistake. To, so, to uh, become a supporter of politics to fight politics. Uh, and that's, but that's what, essentially what you're doing when, you, when you're starting to support immigration controls. You, you st you're supporting more state in, in order to some, sometime later uh, start uh, maybe be able to get rid of it. And I think this the strategy just has to fail. It, it, it just has to because what we need people to, to do is to think outside this, this uh, Political boxes. Pat, and then David, and then you. Yeah, I, I think you know, 
the mass of the, the general population here, I mean, the working class, I mean, they're very clued into the immigration. That's why I, I think, I don't know if you agree with this, why you see the, the, the rise of the right, right across Europe, is because of the immigration. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you agree with that. that yeah, of course. I mean, the right is defined almost by that issue. I mean, economic factors, yes, they're linked into it. But once they, once they start prevailing, I mean, obviously, you know, the immigrants are going to be the first to Well, yeah, I, as I said, I, I, I think immigrants are, are a nice scapegoat for, for politicians yeah. to, to blame the, the problems on. And unfortunately, that works. But that, should, that, that doesn't mean we shouldn't tell people that this is a fallacy. And, and that's all I'm doing. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, obviously lots of people are concerned about immigration. O obviously, lots of people think that there should be borders that we should and that we should close them because we have borders, and they are quite closed uh, as, as a result of people not believing in freedom. But from a libertarian point of view, then we need to change this. We, we need to tell people that freedom is a good thing and that what they believe in is a fallacy. And just Another point. You, you say you're David, uh, go on, you can have another point if you. There's two others speaking. David? Uh, just, uh, it's a fairly small point in, in one sentiment. Uh, freedom of association, I agree with you entirely, entails freedom of people wherever they live, not just to contract with you know, families and so forth, to move. Any place to any other place, mm -hmm. but equally freedom of, of association must involve the right not to associate. And one of the difficulties I think with the current uh, the current setup is that the right disassociation has been partly lost because we have a huge monopoly of uh, anti-discrimination laws and rules and, and regulations, and they are a jolly bad thing. Because uh, it's 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 very difficult to say to somebody you should accept the rights of people to move anywhere they want, including to where you live. Because that's part of the association. But don't you start thinking about discriminating against them in, in terms of you know, whether you can rent property to them or whether you can choose to employ them? Oh, no, 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 no. That choice is taken away from. It seems to me that the two have to go together. Freedom of movement has to go together with an unfettered right on the part of people to choose who they associate with. Uh, and I think one of the problems that we have in the current setup is that one of those freedoms has been partly lost. Yeah, I mean, I, I of course agree. I'm not just advocating open borders. I'm, I'm advocating libertarianism it means freedom overall, which also means freedom to discriminate, if you, if you like to. Uh, of course, it has been lost, but I don't see, where, where I wouldn't agree, I don't know if, if you made that point, but where I wouldn't agree that we made this a condition for us in, uh, to, um, to demand open borders. I think we should demand open borders anyway, and if that leads to problems, then we need to get rid of more stuff. Uh, because if, 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 we, if we start making our own, uh, own um, demands depending on the state doing a lot of other, other stuff first, then, then we don't, we'll never get anywhere. We, we need to con consequently demand the abolition of, of, of statism. And I agree with that. It's just that we mustn't shy away from what our argument entails. Of course, if you, if you really say the state should do less. But. <laughs> <laughs> you say that um, free trade is, is panacea, but will you know, um, soothe all of these tensions. Um, but we presume that people have something to trade. And I think many people fear that an influx of unskilled labour is going to decrease productivity. And that's the real problem. It's not that we're scared of free trade. It's, it's that we're scared of the fact that there is isn't to trade. Yeah, I agree that they fear this. Uh, but I think they're, they're wrong in this. Because uh, people won't come here if they if they're just begging on the street. They will only come here if they if they um, if they can get a job, if they can make some form of living. And in that case, they have something to trade. I mean, everyone has something to trade. Everyone has skills. 
and, and labor that they can trade. And uh, so I disagree with this idea that you have to be rich in order to, to take part in, in, in free trade. This is, everyone has something to offer. No, Pat, <laughs> you're the point. I was, I was just going to mention that uh, you say you come from Germany. And, you know, I, I worked in Germany, when we first joined the European Union, I worked in Germany for seniors. And uh, the first thing I noticed over there, for example, when we joined the European Union, which I was against, was that um, the German police were armed. And I had a bad experience myself, so someone pointed a gun at me because I didn't show my documents immediately. And um, I've never seen a gun before. I've never seen it in Frankfurt. I always say after, when I come back to it, we left the UN 70s. I say, look, this EU, what's going to happen with all these people coming here and working with these ideas, free exchange of ideas? It might be a good thing, but it might be a bad thing. And one of the bad things is this that we're the only country in the world where the police were the army. Certainly in the West. As far as I know this, we will. I said, well, what's going to happen is we're going to have a situation like we have in France or Germany where you haven't got a police force, you've got an army force. It's when you are men and women, it's an army, it's not a police force. But we have your body walking around and you know, it's completely an army. I mean, yeah. within, a, within a few years, I've got to say to people then, you have British coppers walking around with submachine guns. And people will laugh at me and say, don't be that, that will never happen. Within a few years, thanks to Thatcher, that did happen. And we believe one in five now met God to actually are. But yeah. that was, again, uh, was due to what you might call the foreign influence. Absolutely no reason for it whatsoever. There's no reason for the people to want to be. But uh, even it happened. But, but that's what's happened. That's just a simple example, or you know, a simple personal example. Well, that's that's what's happening because people believe in statism and uh, the state grows in, in every aspect. Of course, it, it will get more more more, uh, more 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 power from every every side. Of course, you, you know the police is armed. You will see this increase, and you, they will become paramilitary, as in the U.S. probably. Uh, but well, you know, yeah. because the civil population. Yeah, but the point yeah, is, I'm arguing. I'm arguing, I'm arguing against <laughs> statism. And I, I'm not arguing in favor of the European Union, and I don't argue in favor of the police being armed. I'm arguing against borders, essentially, and I'm arguing against state. And by doing that, I'm arguing against statism in all, all matters. I just picked out immigration for this talk. We can talk about police, how to get rid of the police any time. Point of information, police were armed with trunches. Well, in, in the 1980s, they were armed with guns, but then, if that's the fact that it's My father was a policeman, he told me the rules about trunches over the other day. Can we pull it? You only pull it if you intend to use it, you attach it to your wrist so that they can't take it off you, and you hit them so bloody hard that that's the end of the matter. <laughs> Those are what you're taught as a policeman. And did you actually believe this policeman? As he was my father, yes. yes. <laughs> Uh, David and then Bob. Because uh, I mean, my my instincts are entirely with everything that you said. Uh, it, it would be unfortunate if any uh, policy that is a pro-freedom policy were to be brought in and then would seem to have lots of bad results. I don't think it would. Uh, it would be very bad if people think, well, that's what happens when you open the borders, look at all, look, look all these terrible things. Now, are there some gentle qualifications that one might introduce? Uh, say that one might introduce that, 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 that might reduce the risk in the short term of some bad things happening? Like one is passage. Well, for example, might you uh, refuse to allow people who have convictions? Uh, well, it, it depends on why, why they have convictions. A lot of, if, if you have well, a I, political prisoner, for example, I, I do don't I think, want to let them in? I don't think that, but I'm just sort of. Just 
No, I, I don't. I don't agree with this because then again, you w would need to have all this apparatus that checking on people coming in and out, and that in, in itself is is quite quite uh, dangerous. And I, I don't. I, I, okay, perhaps that's a bad example. You you might, for example, say you, as a statist, I think much, if at all, but uh, people, for example, will very much not like the idea that they would suddenly see a vast increase in street picking. That would not be regarded as a good thing. It would, it, would be, uh, it, it would be very bad PR for an open border policy if you had 50 times the number of people trying to clean your windscreen when you stopped at every traffic light in London. Uh, if you saw lots and lots of women begging with babies, if you saw, you know, now, I'm, I'm not saying that that would necessarily happen. Uh, well, I mean, it, you it, can, of course, in, in introduce policies that to, for, for public safety to, to not have people back in the streets. I mean, I, I believe there are already a lot of these policies in, in, in place that it's a different policy than, uh, than immigration. But I, I actually think these things will actually take care of themselves because if people are annoyed by beggars, they, won't, they will stop giving them something. And that business model is, is then basically busted. Um, you, you, you see this in, in poor countries. I mean, if you ever have visited a poor country, uh, as soon as you go, to, go out of a, of a tour bus or something, you have, a, you have a flock of beggars around you trying to, to get some money off you. And the first day you might still get, get, get them, give them something, but uh, you stop doing this quite quickly because you know, once you give them something, it will follow you and, 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 and try to get more off, off you. So I think these, these things will, will quickly take care of, of, of themselves. Well, um, there is a tragic aspect to this, um, not so much the cultural fears, but all the simply um, bad economics. The idea that there are only so many jobs, we can't get work for our own, our own, therefore why should we let you into the country? Kind of idea. Now in America, of course, it, it hoovered up, well it didn't, it just let people in. They didn't, they weren't paid to come, they weren't sucked into the country. They travel at their own expense. I think Norway lost two thirds of its, say, lost two thirds of the Norwegian population cleared off. It was very large anyway. It's <laughs> not, a lot of, not a lot of people. But uh, I went to America, and America flourished as a consequence of all these immigrants. But because of um, Duff economics in the 1930s, when um, people categorised as Jewish could have left Europe, should have left Europe would have invigorated and enriched America, culturally and economically, and or Australia or wherever, where it's a bloody great howling nothingness, as you said, plenty of room there, couldn't get out. Could not get out. Now, perhaps they did not know what would happen to the people who would have liked to get out, but still. Yeah, I find this, I find this the most appalling aspect of, of this whole thing. I think there are two, two things that libertarians find very hard to communicate to people. One is we are perceived to not care about the poor. We are some, somehow just caring about our own profits. And the other one is to, to make people see that the state is actually quite a violent uh, institution. It's not a, at all the nice uncle that takes care of you. Behind the state are guns. And I think in, in the immigration issue, you see both of this quite blatantly. You see an army of, of, of people pointing guns at, at poor unarmed people coming from Africa over. Uh, and, and trying to, to, to keep them out. So there you have it, the, the state is really fighting the, the majority of poor people. It's not at all an organization that is concerned with poor. And you can expose everyone that uh, is supporting the state uh, to, to provide welfare as a hypocrite because a lot of these people are actually against open borders because they're protectionists, essentially. And on this issue, we could actually be very strong and, and, and just say, look, you guys are hypocrites. We really want to help the poor. We are not at all called. We are not the guys who, who, who are hiring these people, uh, pointing guns at, at these poor people. And I think there's, there are few political things that, uh, where you can see the brutality of the state so, so well. I mean, we, we see the detention centers of, of, of these poor immigrants that have done nothing wrong. They just have the wrong passport and they've been born in the wrong country. That's, that's a crime. You know? We wind them up, put them in these detention centers for, for, for nothing. And we even see, you know, uh, broken boats and, and, and drowned corpses swimming in the Mediterranean. And this is supposed to be a policy that uh, some libertarians think, ah, well, we can't, we, we want to get rid of statism, but 
immigration because like, there we should there we should uh, maybe support the state. I mean, if if you support the state on this one, you will not make anyone believe that you are serious about the poor and you are serious about fighting fighting uh, the, the the brutality that the state uh, actually provides. I think this is it's quite quite an absurd idea. Yes. Um, I think the biggest the biggest problem is when you have large numbers of people coming in to an area where their culture is such that they think that there are some appropriate cases where they need to use force to resolve problems. And the uh, the you know the method whereby you detect, protect individual rights can't cope with that volume. I mean you had in America you had the Irish and the English kept their blood feud going on in the States in the, um, in the frontier days. And the law enforcement, the sheriffs and things like that, they were all in on it. Well, there, wasn't, there wasn't a proper method of defending individual rights. Um, and with the Islamic fundamentalist problems and, and many other cultures, they have just horrible, abysmal cultures. Um, they think that it's right to throw acid in people's faces or to um, murder women that have been raped. And if the infrastructure is not here to prosecute them and to make sure that they are not going to do these barbaric practices here, then that's that's the that's the worry that you have. That's the cultural problem. Yeah, but I mean, I'm not against going against criminals, uh, and I think we need to have some kind of methods to deal with real criminals who do real violent crimes anyway. If if we currently have a system that is unable to deal with criminals, well, then we better fix it. Uh, that it can deal with criminals. We need to do have that anyway because we have some local criminals as, as well. So I don't see this as a, as a particular problem of immigration. And I think this is a small minority of of immigrants that actually commits these violent acts. I, I mean, I'm from Germany. The biggest immigration group is are Turks from from East Anatolia, which have a lot of of these family uh, feeds and, and so on. And you have problems with uh, women, you know, being killed for having uh, pre. Uh, for sex before marriage by, by their own brothers in, in, in the middle of, of, of daylight. Of course it happens. It's, it's a problem. You have to deal with that. Uh, but it's by no means the majority of, of these immigrants. Yeah. They are even within their own immigration group. Is, that is a small minority. But I agree. Of course you cannot, you cannot let people murder each other, uh, or the, the, their daughters. Of course you need to deal with it. And hopefully we have a system uh, that can deal with murderers. If we don't, then we better get one. So the thing is, I don't think we're talking about these extreme cases, like where someone actually kills a sister. We're talking about a radically different worldview, outlook on life. Yeah, I know, but... Uh, so it's, that's really general. It's they're not committing crimes, and they might be perfectly charming to chat on the bus and so on. But there's a big difference. But we don't see this to be generally the case. I mean, there are millions of Turkish people in, in Germany, literally, and these cases happen occasionally. So if, if all of them had this attitude, we would, we would see massive amounts of, of women being killed for all kinds of, of crimes. We see a lot of them actually adopting to the local culture, see that this is maybe a, a bit old-fashioned, old all these, these, these ideas that uh, um, circulate from where they come from, and they actually integrate. It's a small minority of people. It's, a f it's usually just first a generation uh, type of immigrants that, that do this stuff. Just because the numbers have been controlled. So you took away the borders, then it's going to become overwhelming. Oh, no, 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 no. Can I just talk to ask you, sorry, I'm not speaking out of turn, but I just wanted just to get to the idea. economic question, because you seem to believe that the economic thing could, you know, the free trade and free winning by winning seller could take care of it. But what if, because of the difference in values, you have, say, some kind of group that comes in and then they can supply all kinds of business services because they're using something like slavery. And in their worldview, that's all fine. They can take women and children and exploit them. And then there's British people saying, you know what, I can I get a half price cleaner, or I can have my toilets cleaned for nothing. I can have babysitters and nursery people for nothing. And the fact that this is slave labor as well, you know, I'm, I'm doing them a favor by letting them in my lovely home. Well, I'm not so for. Is that, is that what you mean by this, the, you know, the trade? No, I mean, free, that's, that's not free trade. Slavery is not free trade. Slavery is something that is the opposite of free trade. I mean, free trade means everyone has the right to 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 rule their own lives and, and you know to to their property. For, as a, what if these so-called slaves? They in the system. They they willingly there. Well, you mean by slaves? You, you mean by slaves? 
Yeah. People paid low wages. You know, you guys have got the assumption that everybody yeah. arrives there with suit with baggage and oil panties and the luggage and stuff, and they all they've got, you know, they've got something to offer, and it's all wonderful. You know, they're yeah, people born here with who are complete arseholes. Um, <laughs> and violent, and thuggish, and prey upon other people, innocent people. And, well, yeah, I, and? I, I don't know. I, I think you have a way too, way too, too, uh, too negative view of other cultures. So I mean, to have, to, have a, to have trade, which is what British have always been really good at, is you've got to have like sort of shared assumptions. No, 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 that's false. No, no you, society is not based on values or common values. It's based on the division of labour. Yeah, it's like based, based on trade. Yeah, I think that's, that's that's true. I mean, you basically just need to follow your own interests. Well, why do some societies they simply can't do it? Because they have government screwing it up. That's, that's, that's anyway, the main reason. Anyway, I, 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 this, lady is, uh, this lady's turn to sort now. Yes, um, I think I've lost the thread of thoughts after that. Um, so, it was vaguely to do with um, your very correct assumption that the problem is not with uh, as few extremists, but it is a problem where you have soft cultural assumptions. That, um, that kind of infiltrate the normal day-to-day -day culture. For example, we, you know, we have things like arranged marriages, which ostensibly are, are not a violation of rights because these girls go willingly into these arranged marriages. No, it is a violation of rights. It's just... but, uh, well, but that's the problem. I mean, as Bryn was saying, if you have um, if you have too many people who share these assumed cultural notions, um, eventually it will. Into but, look, the, the reason why they have these cultural assumptions is because they come from a, from a primi primitive tribalistic culture. And, but they're moving to a modern ca a capitalistic culture. And that will have an influence on them. You, you, you're just assuming that they're totally incapable of changing and just having, having, having uh, and, and that uh, once they are in a capitalistic culture and trade with each other, they will not, uh, not, not, not change this. I think this is false. And we see this. I mean, as I said, I, I'm from Germany. There, is, there are these first generation um, people who still believe in arranged marriages. Second generation doesn't happen. And of course, the German state is going after them if, 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 he, if, he, if, he, if he knows about this. I'm not in favor of arranged marriages uh, because I, I want basic uh, liberty rights for everyone. And we need, of course, a system that enforces these. What's wrong with the arranged marriage? Yeah? Uh, most arranged marriages are entirely voluntary. They're more like introduction agencies. They're not forced, and it's only certain, you know, a small minority where there's any force involved. Mm -hmm. They give arranged marriages bad names. You simply introduce the people to each other who might suit each other, and then they're left together to see if they agree. Well, that's of and course voluntary and, and, and fun. When we say arranged, you mean forced. I, th I understood her. Yeah, that was, uh, no, 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 well, then I'm fine with it. I, I, I think I think Weber's wrong anyway. But so, well, thank you very much indeed for it. Yes, I think that's it. Very good. Thank you.